And so I, I had found a little gold mine where the demand was massive, but the people fulfilling that demand really weren't there. The realtors weren't super competent, still aren't. Not a lot of people that knew how to use, you know, the internet or any new tools down there. Um, but there was massive demand. So it was imbalanced in the sense that it was a very hot market on the buyer side, but it seemed to be very cold in that I had no competition. All right. Welcome everybody to the big picture blueprint uh, with Dan Haberkost and Mason McDonald. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about really what is a spectrum of the pros and cons of hot versus colder markets. Uh, we're sp talking specifically in land, but this is applicable across the board. Uh, of course, before we get into that, Mason, how's it going? It's going pretty well, man. Uh, you know, been traveling a little bit, so excited to get back into the swing of things um, and talk about this because I think, uh, you know, we have varying opinions and, you know, desires, uh, you know, with the markets that each of us are in. Um, you know, I think I'm in some colder markets and you're in some hotter markets and we get jealous of each other sometimes. Um, and I'm excited to unpack that and uh, really dive into it today. Sure. Yeah. With anything, there's always pros and cons. And usually for every pro, there's a corresponding con and vice versa. Um, but let's just get right into it. Uh, do you maybe want to kick us off with kind of talking about markets you're in and, and what you see pro and con wise? Yeah, absolutely. So and, and we're being, you know, rather uh, vague with what our definitions of a hot market and a cold market are. Um, you know, and I, I think the best way to look at it is, you know, transaction data where you can go and zoom in on a particular, you know, let's say a city um, or a town or just, you know, a square mile. And in hot markets in the past 30 days, you're going to see anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 to 50 transactions that are occurring from a sales perspective versus cold markets, uh, you might see zero. Um, but yep. yeah, I, I think for me, you know, I'm, I'm entirely in Colorado and Arizona in my business. And um, Arizona is a hotter market from a state perspective than Colorado is. Um, but with that being said, you know, each market is very specific all the way down to the subdivision level. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, kind of around that to define um, cold markets, which where I guess we can start start at, um, they're going to be more rural, typically. They're not going to be right in, you know, the middle of a city or a middle of a very, you know, new developing subdivision. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the pros of being in a colder market is you're going to have less competition. And I think that something that is really nice uh, whenever you're sending out marketing you know, materials and the good thing about our business, you know, where we send all direct mail marketing, um, it's not very expensive, but you're going to get a much higher deal ratio whenever that happens. But um, I, I, I don't know, Dan, uh, what, what do you think about cold markets at a high level? Because I, I feel like we should really kind of focus on defining it. And I, I wish we had some metrics in front of us to define it more. I, I kind of do. So on my end, when I look at a market, one of the first things I check is in the last 30 days. And if it's if we're in a more stable time, I would go last 90 days. But right now, last 30 days, because everything's been changing a lot this year, I look at how many lots came on the market versus how many sold. And so some of the markets I'm in in Florida and North Carolina, 20, 30, 40 percent more have sold in that time frame than have come on the market. And so that tells me, okay, this is a really hot market. Whereas, you know, Corrales, New Mexico, I have one closing to sell there. And I, I forget the exact ratio, but it was more like double the amount of lots had come on the market in the prior period of time than had sold. And the total volume of both lots on the market and lots that had sold was very small. It was like 10 came on the market and five sold in the last, I think that was like 90 days specifically there. And so that is what I would define as a much colder market. And then my expectations around what I'm going to sell it at, how I need to price it relative to the other lots uh, change quite a bit. So we can talk about that. But I'll pause. That makes so much sense. It, it, it's the idea right there that uh, the demand is greater than the supply. And whenever you're in a market and you're, you know, looking into a market, if there's a thousand parcels on the market and in the past six months a hundred of them have sold 
that's going to be a very cold market. And with that being said, it doesn't mean you can't be doing business in a market like that. Yes. It just means you have to um, undercut the competition on the the pricing side whenever you're actually selling it. So, you know, with, within... Yeah, can I just yeah, speak go. to that? I, a perfect example. I got a lot in a section of Point Siena, Florida, that there's a lot on the market. I'm talking dozens and very few sales. But I got it low enough that I can be in an area of lots selling around 30 ish, I can be six, seven, even 8,000 below even the nearest lot. So that's fine. That's fine. I'll still buy it. We still bought that one and we'll list it. And that's, that's totally fine. Uh, so just as an example, it still works if you buy deep enough. Oh yeah. Well, and, and it's the old adage, you know, you make your money when you buy. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think, you know, kind of going back to the pros and cons, you know, with, you know, Dan, you did a great job kind of summarizing the definition there of, um, you know, Cold markets, it's just higher higher supply, less demand. Uh, hot markets, it's higher demand, less supply. Um, so within cold markets, uh, you know, one of the other con or pros for me that I, I really like within them, you know, I'm in Douglas County, Colorado, for instance, and I've made decent money there. Um, but uh, the money that I do make, it's a really, really high return because since there's less competition and there's uh, less transaction data, it gives you know, it gives us a greater, um, greater ability to really, really purchase at a steep discount because not only do I not know 100% what the value is, uh, neither does the seller. Um, but usually realtors will have a good idea. And that's why it's so important to partner with local realtors whenever you're in a market, because they can say, Hey, you know, this property might take a while to sell because it's very specific. Um, but it's going to sell very high because it's such a desirable area. And that's kind of confusing. Um, and honestly, a frustration in this business for me is, you know, these beautiful lots and these beautiful neighborhoods where they're surrounded by beautiful homes and you go in there and you're like, oh crap, like I can, I can make a lot of money in this, but it, it, it might take a longer time. Um, so there, there's a little bit of confusion. That's kind of one of the cons there of you're going to typically have a much longer sales cycle uh, whenever there is greater supply than demand, because, you know, it's, uh, in, in land in general, um, you know, I feel like there's less emotion tied to it than there are, you know, there yes. is in, you know, residential single family homes, but I feel like that's not necessarily the case in some of these colder markets. And these, are, and what I'm talking about with these specific colder markets is they're still desirable. They're still nice communities and everything like that. And we can go also into the cold markets where it's the rural kind of middle of nowhere markets as well. But, um, there's a lot more emotion tied because these are the places where families are going to build, you know, their vacation home or, you know, they're going to build an estate uh, eventually. Um, it's, you know, very nice luxury homes and luxury communities. Um, Mason, I, I really want to quickly interject there. Part of, or some of these colder markets are not necessarily, you know, having an abundance of supply. There's just, almost no, de no demand and there's very little supply and it's more that they're just very expensive and mostly built out. So I know some of the lots you have in Douglas County, there aren't a lot of lots on the market. There's just very few. There's, you know, one to two transactions happening every quarter and it's just really expensive. Exactly. Well, and, and, and that's the thing. And the funny thing about it is, you know, if you look at that and you, you go back 12 months instead of 30 days, um, and you see, okay, well, there's uh, 10 properties on the market and three have sold. And, you know, you might hear that. And in if you're in a rural county or something like that, where, okay, there's 10 properties on the market from 15 to $20,000. And there's been five that have sold on market, you know, at nine to $12,000. And the markets we're talking about are, okay, there's, you know, 30 properties on the market. And in the past year, there's been 12 or 15 that have sold, um, but they're, selling at 150 to 250 up to, you know, a lot I have listed right now in the, the high 600s. Um, so it's, it's exactly that of, it's impossible to have a high amount of supply because they're so built out and they're so desirable, but that, that once again, makes it a more niche buyer, uh, which is one of the cons of it, of, you know, from we love exit strategies in land. That's one of the reasons that we both invest in land because you have so many opportunities that we've talked about in previous episodes. But, uh, you know, if you're in, uh, you know, a colder luxury market is kind of what we're fixating on right now. 
And it's a beautiful, you know, five acre property that you could build an estate, you know, it's listed, you know, half a million to $750,000. You're not going to go in there and build your own home, you know, or build a builder grade home or an entry level home or even a custom home, because think about the end buyer and, you know, keep the end buyer in mind. They're going to want to build their own home, yeah. but you need someone that needs that exact lot in that exact neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. But that while that is a con, you know, I, I, I do think the higher margins, um, you know, that are associated with these colder luxury markets uh, or even the colder rural markets um, can be really nice because you just have mm -hmm. to build out your business effectively and, you know, adjust your assumptions and expectations of what the sales <laughs> cycle will be uh, just because it's a really desirable area you know, you have a very limited buyer pool. Um, what are some other pros that we can think of in, in, in cold markets? And maybe, maybe we can shift gears to maybe the more rural markets rather than the luxury uh, cold markets. Well, to summarize pretty succinctly, they're just far more inefficient. And so it's much easier to buy at a steep discount. You have less competition, which I think you already mentioned, um, the higher margins, owner financing and creative strategies become more common because the same problem that you might have when you go to sell is applicable to the seller uh, of that lot. And so you could put an option to buy on a lead you have, you could buy it via owner financing yourself. Uh, there are a lot more creative strategies on the buy side. And, you know, kind of as a corollary to that, because it's less competitive, because these people probably have owned it for 20, 30 years. They're not in a rush. If you need to go do two weeks of due diligence, you're not worried about eight other people calling, mailing, and, and texting them. Um, so it's a little bit more relaxed. Uh, and I, I think it just gives you more time to do more thorough due diligence and potentially you know, get the lot uh, at a small down payment and then turn around and, and, and sell it um, yourself. Uh, as opposed to to having to quickly close and resell, like in many of the markets I'm in. Absolutely, and, and um, on that, I do feel like uh, that you know a, a lot of people that are getting involved in land flipping. Everyone enjoys land and is really attractive, and it's you know kind of getting sexier, you know, within the real estate investing strategy, uh, you know, world. Um, is the low barrier to entry where? You know, with any of the markets that you or I are in, there has to be a certain level of desirability where, you know, I, I've heard so often, you know, from different podcasts or reading different books or, you know, the different courses and everything that are out there of go buy the desert squares, you know, go buy the desert squares for $100 and turn around and sell them for $1,000. And the thing is, you know, that does work kind of. Um, but I feel like a lot of times I see people just get stuck with these lots because, mm -hmm. you know, while there is a buyer pool, you know, for, for every piece of land, and I firmly believe that every piece of land is sellable at a certain price, um, you're just going to be beating your head against the wall. And, and we're not self-certain in the strategies that we use in business and not everyone needs to be making, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars per year. But if um, you anticipate or expect to turn what could be a side hustle and land flipping um, or, you know, land and development uh, into a full time gig and you're looking to make, you know, at least $100,000 a year. Um, it takes just as much work, if not much, much, much more work to sell a lot and make $500 on it than it does to sell a lot and make $25,000 on it. So. Um, you can invest in these cold markets and invest in these weird land markets and just recognize that the sales cycle, uh, the desirability and the buyer pool might be a lot less than what you've heard that there might be. Um, and so, you know, that owner financing component can be attractive to get that much mon monthly cash flow. Um, but if you're selling something on a note and it's a two thousand, three thousand dollar note, uh, the person that doesn't have two thousand, three thousand dollars cash. And this is not me being. Um, you know, rude or attempting to, you know, reduce the ignorance of who these buyers are, uh, they're, they're probably going to default on their payment um, at some point. And it's just going to create more and more headaches down the road, which is what you're going to get in some yeah. of those super rural markets. Yeah. And a lot of them too, you better be careful because the land is not useful. And oftentimes the buyer doesn't realize that and you can very easily get yourself in trouble there. So I would, uh, we've talked about this in prior episodes, but avoid land that is, is useless. 
exactly. You know, it's you you can make money on it, uh, but just just be transparent. You know, all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. You know, both from the acquisition side. Don't get ahead of yourself and don't get too excited because. You know what happens whenever we send huge mailing campaigns out you know whether it's a blind offer or a postcard uh it's the really shitty lots that people mm -hmm. give you the calls back on and so like a lot of those leads are going to come in and and it's useless because they're so excited yeah. to get rid of it because you know what happened is 20 30 40 50 years ago whether they they bought it or inherited it they realized oh crap there's nothing that i can do with this lot um you know i would be glad to part ways with it for two hundred and fifty, five hundred dollars, or you know, whatever, um, and then it's just going to be your problem. And you want less problems in your business to deal with. You want to solve people's problems, um, but you don't want to make them your own now. If that makes sense. Yep. So, well, Absolutely. well, let's let's shift gears a little bit to go into the hot market, Stan. Um, you know, and that that's I feel like your bread and butter. What, what what are some of your favorite things about hot markets that you're in? And you know, once again, maybe define what a hot market is. Yeah, I think uh, another way to say this is we're talking about high volume, high velocity markets versus low volume, low velocity markets. And on the other side of the spectrum here, on the higher volume and velocity markets, land sells very quickly. There's a huge amount of demand. The exit strategies are more varied, which we'll get into. And it is very, very easy to comp because there are maybe hundreds of sales every month. A lot of the markets I'm in, there are hundreds of lots selling every single month in Florida in North Carolina. Now on the on the con side, you're going to deal with far more competition. You're going to have a lot of people with no money calling your sellers and 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 just wasting their time but then making making that seller think anyone sending him a postcard or, or calling them is the same. Um and so really it's just easier on the sell side and harder on the buy side. Generally you don't get as good of margins, uh although it's quick. Uh, so those are just some pros and cons, and we can we can dive into that. But most of the markets I'm in are quicker to sell, but a little bit hard to get deep discounts. So, of course, Mason and I always joke that we need to mesh our two business strategies so that he has more consistent closings. Uh, and then I have some bigger ones along with my more consistent closings. Absolutely. And I, I think at the tail end of the show, that that's what we should kind of talk to about the, the ideal business model and kind of split there of you know, we can, that, that'd be fun to break it down from like a million dollar business standpoint, the best way to do it. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I am jealous of you and your markets whenever you're like, man, it took me uh, from, you know, first contact with the seller to uh, closing on the sales side, you know, 30 days or 21 days yeah. or something like that, because it's essentially liquid cash, but you do have that reduction in margin because of the great, greater amount of competition. And I think it goes into where, you know, land land that you're seeking, you know, it's it's horizontally developed at this point in time. It's pretty much, you know, if you're driving around, you know, the new or neighborhoods where, you know, construction has been going on since, you know, the 2000s at least or 2010s, um, you know, it's just the vacant lot in the neighborhood that you drive by that, you know, maybe kids have been playing on it or something like that, uh, you know, in the middle of the average neighborhood. And, you know, why there's more competition is because it's newer. You know, subdivides in these subdivisions usually take a long time to make happen. But if that, you know, neighborhood has only been in existence for 20 years, uh, potentially that owner hasn't owned it for 40 years, like some of the lots that I that I buy, if that make or if, if you agree with that, Dan. Well, the one thing I would say as far as newer, the growth is newer. So some of these uh, markets I'm in were initially done in the 60s but they didn't actually grow until just recently. And so kind of to your point, there's builders everywhere. There's new homes going up. Again, there's thousands of homogenous lots that are exactly the same. And so it's easier to price, again, lower barrier to entry, which leads to more competition. But, you know, on the, on the positive side, you know, speaking to the multiple disposition strategies, I have a lot in Cape Coral that's selling to uh, DR Horton. And so I was talking to their land acquisition guy for Southwest Florida and getting his buy box so I can just send them right to him and I can know, hey, if I get a lot that looks like this, they will buy it. But again, it's much harder to go source. And so uh, to, to that end, uh, assignments are more feasible. Mm -hmm. A lot of times builders are fine with that and or double closes. Uh, so that's a little bit harder to do in the rural markets if you have a $400,000 lot uh, as opposed to if you have a $50,000 lot and there's builders everywhere, you can probably get away with an assignment or even just a very quick resale. 
Absolutely. So well, it's it's the idea of the comfortability with the level of margins, and if you have the opportunity to wholesale or double close on a lot, you know, if you you know, assuming you can have transactional funding, if if there's a requirement to actually bring the money to the closing table with it, that you know, if you are comfortable making you know three, five, ten grand on it because you have an established relationship with a uh, you know national builder who's used to this kind of stuff of you know it's very minimal risk of if you can build a marketing machine. Um, you know, then, then you can do that kind of stuff uh, all the time in it. And I think, you know, you, you kind of touched on the point of, you know, it's these areas that are in progress and starting, to, mm -hmm. starting to grow. And there's a lot of desire as versus, you know, I feel like a lot of these, you know, uh, you know, low, lower demand areas are in the path of progress, but maybe not quite there yet. Um, and I feel like you're, you know, the, progress path of progress is going like this if you're you're watching me making crazy hand movements on youtube um and you've gotten there as it's going on rather than you know six months or two years or ten years uh too too soon actually i i like that point because some of the markets you're in are way past the initial growth and are very mature and so that's probably a simple way to say it a lot of these hotter markets are right in that if you think of a, a spectrum right of growth or a chart of growth they're right in the hottest part where they're growing as fast as they'll ever grow. And then a lot of these slower markets are either way too early or late in the sense that they're very mature, mostly built out and now very, very expensive. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think that's a, a good way to say it. But a couple more points I just want to make about the, the hotter markets where if you call a couple of realtors, they all know what assignments are. They know what you're doing. They tend to there tends to be a lot more competent people who can help you on the title and realtor side of things. Whereas, and I'll use an example coming up. I remember there was a market that uh, we called a couple realtors and they go, oh, oh no, you can't buy that lot. It's not on the market. <laughs> they didn't even, they didn't even understand the concept of direct to seller marketing or the fact that you could buy something off the market. Um, so again, there are a lot of pros to these hot markets, but ultimately there's more competition and it's harder to buy at a discount. Yep. Yep. And, and so once again, it, it, it doesn't matter exactly which one you're in. And, you know, we, we said it before of, you know, I'm, I'm jealous of Dan where my sales cycles on some of these bigger ones are, uh, they take a long time and it can be stressful from a mindset perspective in the business of, uh, you could, you know, potentially over leverage yourself in business if you're buying and buying and buying and buying. And even though you know it's being bought at a discount, you know, you've got confirmation based on sales data and, you know, realtor insight. And, you know, even if you go out and drive to it and you get a feel and you're like, you know, this lot right here, it's surrounded by multi million dollar homes. It's beautiful. It's the last lot in a neighborhood. I think you, you said it really well there, Dan, of, you know, it's it's path past the path of progress. Um, you know, it's it, it already did that. Um, you know, decades ago, uh, but it's still a very, very desirable community. It's an older community, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, it can be stressful in the business where, you know, that's where we have a lot of fun of, you know, you you buy these lots and, you know, you call them and it's liquid cash because they sell so quickly. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, you might make, you know, 40, you know, 30, 40, 50%, you know, cash on cash return, you know, HUD to HUD, where I might make a 200 or 300% cash on cash return, a very high amount. But yep. if you annualize both of them, they end up getting relatively similar results. Um, you know, if you're buying a lot at uh, 25 and selling it at 45 and you make, you know, $13,000 after all closing costs versus buying one at, you know, 250 and selling it at 600, um, but it taking a year to sell, um, how many of those smaller ones could you have done if you didn't have that much capital, um, you know, laid out uh, from there? But yep. uh yeah, I think one more point of the pro of the the hotter markets or the higher demand markets that I want to hit on is, uh, you know, talking a little bit more about the exit strategies and comparing that to those uh, lower demand, lower supply markets where, you know, if you go in and it's a subdivision that already exists, already established, you know, has, you know, homes in, you know, the the two hundred and seventy five to four hundred thousand dollar range, um, you can go in and build a pretty simple you know, stick build three, three bed, two bath entry level home. And, you know, that number might be high in certain markets. And, but the markets we're talking about $350,000 home uh, that you can build for $250,000. That's one way that you can take that uh, high demand 
um, market or that acquisition where say you only buy it at a discount that would give you, you know, a 30 or 20% cash on cash return. But now you have the opportunity to, you know, create a vertical integration in your business that allows you to get the margins that you get. And then it's on a similar timeline as some of those other ones, which I know that's something that you're starting to do even, even more of than you've done in the past now, right, Dan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've always done a few spec homes at a time or pre-sales, but found a, a better builder here. So working on getting quite a few of those going. Uh, and it's a great exit strategy. If you set that up correctly, it's very, very simple. New construction is much easier and less risky than, um, say, flipping houses because it's the same box every time if you know what you're doing. So, And it, it, it just gives you so much opportunities, which is why the most important skill you know that you can learn is that direct to seller marketing because there, believe it or not, are so few people that are good at lead gen. And, yeah. and, and I think the anecdote that you said about, uh, um, you know, the realtor that didn't know you could buy property off market kind of shows yeah. me that that realtor probably doesn't know really anything about lead gen because they're in a, such a hot market. And if they can advertise well, you know, everyone just comes to them as versus going out and, you know, sending postcards and, you know, doing all the stuff that really, really good realtors that are trying to grow a huge, huge, you know, volume business can do. So if you can develop that skill and if you can effectively analyze a property based on local market knowledge, um, you're going to be able to make money. And, and you know, one one last thing with kind of the the lower demand markets, it's, it's all depending on your desired profit where, you know, mm -hmm. talking about the lot paid 350, put on the market for 675. You know, if I, was comfortable making $50,000 on that, you know, I could turn around and sell it at a very steep discount and probably move it very, very quickly. Um, but it's not going to, to work, you know, as well for investors and whenever you're trying to actually make a significant amount of money. So, you know, change your assumptions, uh, depending on the market that you're in. Sure. And I'm glad you brought up the realtor I referenced, because that's a good transition into Kind of the last scenario I wanted to talk about, we wanted to talk about was it is possible to find markets that are hot in demand, but very cold as far as the business people fulfilling that demand. So what do I mean? Well, easy example, uh, Pueblo West, Colorado, end of 2020, I started mailing there heavily. I had been mailing there a little bit just to get lots for new builds. That's how I learned about land initially was from the perspective of actually building homes and just sourcing the land for that. And land was really starting to go up there. Colorado Springs had, had just seemed to reach a tipping point where people were pushed further down I-25, further down the front range, and it just about tripled overnight. And I, I mean, I'm not exaggerating at all. And so all of a sudden, everyone was used to lots selling from 10 to 15,000 and they're selling at 30,000. And all these people had bought land in Pueblo West 20, 30, 40 years ago for a couple thousand dollars. And so I started sending out mail there. Uh, it was land offer letters at the time offering 10,000. And I was getting a deal per every 50 or 100 mailers at 10,000 that was selling at between 25 to 35, depending on where and what. And so I, I had found a little gold mine where the demand was massive, but the people fulfilling that demand really weren't there. The realtors weren't super confident, still aren't. Not a lot of people that knew how to use, you know, the internet or any new tools down there. Um, but there was massive demand. So it was imbalanced in the sense that it was a very hot market on the buyer side, but it seemed to be very cold in that I had no competition. Mm -hmm. And so I found that a few times. They've been brief windows. But it's amazing when you do. Well, and, and you know, you're going to never quite time the market perfectly. You know, it's time the market and understanding, you know, all the you we, we could, you know, spend 45 minutes and you could tell me, you know, 10, 10 percent of what you know about Pueblo West as a market because you've been in it for so long where mm -hmm. you were getting a deal every, you know, you know. 50 mailers or whatever, I, I sent 2000 or 3000 to Pueblo West. Uh, and I got absolutely zero deals, only one call that said, screw off, you're the worst person in the yeah. world. So, you know, that that worked exactly then. And I think, you know, the, the biggest thing to recognize too, is the complexities of the market where, you know, we, you know, put in the notes here, you know, Pagosa Springs, where, you know, that's where I did my first deal. That's where I've done a lot of deals. And I invest really, you know, pretty heavily, but, you know, my parents, Parents have moved there and, you know, they're building right now. Um, you know, I've got a rehab going on on a commercial building there right now. And the problem is, 
while there might be a huge amount of desirability to live in that area, it's gorgeous. Everyone from Texas goes in vacations there. Um, you can't build a freaking house there. And um, unless you're, you know, a small local builder, I mean, there's only a few builders in town. There's almost no architects available. You have to, you know, travel, you know, out of city, out of state sometimes to get all the work done where, you know, you in Pueblo West End can, you know, from, you know, acquisition of the land to getting, you know, uh, you know, construction going can only take you what, a couple of weeks, give or yep. take um, to yep. actually like be moving dirt um, there in Pagosa. It might take a year. Um, you know, and that's for a, you know, ready to build a horizontal, like utilities extended to the property and everything, you know, city water, city sewer, electric and phone, you know, fiber. Um, so I think you have to kind of understand the, the nuances that are going to be associated with a market in the varying times where, you know, when money was really, really cheap, you know, in 2021, uh, you know, 2021 into 2022, it's a very different now money is very expensive, uh, while building uh, you know, materials have come back down, the cost to build has, you know, gone back up because of the financeability or the bankability, um, you know, associated with it. So just be thinking and recognizing that, um, you know, who is your end buyer in these markets? Is it going to be an individual? Is it going to be a builder? Um, who's it going to be? And, you know, recognize that just because that market was hot six months ago, it might be gone now because maybe they're out of water taps in that particular community or, Maybe there's a moratorium on building for, you know, one reason, or maybe in a vacation community, you know, Pagosa Springs in 2022, uh, put a moratorium on short-term rentals. So people yeah. were not as interested in going and building a vacation home that they're going to be there two weeks out of the year. So I think, you know, you don't need to necessarily, you know, as a business owner, you don't need to understand every single aspect of every single market you're in. Um, that'd be ridiculous uh, to, to expect that, but you do need to know what's going on in that market. Or if you don't, um, have those real conversations with the people that are in the market every single day. Uh, so you know what your acquisition price can be because you can make money on any deal, but you just got to know whether that's feasible or not. Yeah. Yeah. No, a number of good points made there. And especially about the degree to which markets change and change quickly. And so uh, people will ask, well, how do I find a market like that? That's that hot yet that easy and it's just by testing so I, I found another market like this end of last year in north carolina i had maybe a what four or five month window or maybe not even three or four month window where i was getting like a two or three percent response rate closing deals left and right while there was huge demand for the land and then it you know word got out right and that market is far far more competitive now i still do a lot of business there but it's just not as easy as it was and so you find these opportunities by continually trying new areas, testing new mailers um, and retesting areas too, because, you know, I'll tell you there's a, a market in Florida where there's an old lead we had from years ago that wasn't interesting, but, oh, that whole section of town had water and sewer installed. Now it's far more interesting. And so uh, the point I'm trying to make is you always have to be adapting and testing, adapting and testing. And that's how you find new opportunities and not get phased out. Agreed. Agreed. Well, uh, I, I wanted to jump back in into it at the end of the episode, you know, so to create a million dollar business, um, you know, th this was a realization that, you know, at least was relatively profound for me when we were working out at the gym last year of, okay, you know, we, we set the goal, you know, for 2023 to, to each make at least a million dollars in our land flipping business. Um, and what, made it so much more simple to me is, okay, if I, if I make $10,000 per flip that I do or per deal that I do, I need to do a hundred deals this year, or I could do 50, $20,000 deals, or I could do 25, $40,000 deals, you know, and so on and so forth, or, you know, 10, $100,000 deals. So um, I think, you know, hearing kind of what we're talking about and what we're saying of, you know, those $100,000, $200,000 flips, um, they might take you six months to a year to do one of those. So Dan, if you were to, you know, break it down, you know, from the, the 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, hundred thousand dollar flips, what would be kind of your desired uh, percentage, assuming that, you know, the, the hundred thousand plus are going to take anywhere from, you know, six months to 18 months and the 10,000 ones might take 30 days. How would you, you know, kind of want to break down your business 
not necessarily from like the high level executive standpoint of, you know, creating balance sheet business or anything like that, but from you personally and your, your own um, kind of desires and mindset and comfortability. Sure. I would want it to be, and this is what I'm working on in my own business, more of a 70, 30 split where about 70% of what we're doing is the quick stuff so that there's consistent income coming in every month. And then the 30% being the big stuff. And to be clear, that's just for the initial, whatever amount of money you want to make. I'm saying this is applicable to that. I wouldn't want to do that to infinity because, you know, I just want the quick stuff to keep a consistent income coming in. So above and beyond what I want to make or see as kind of my floor, I'm looking more just to do the big ones. So as you know, doing quite a few more builds, uh, you're doing some subdivides. And, and again, tell me if you disagree, but uh, I only need a certain amount coming in every month just to feel comfortable both in my business and just you know personally. Uh, above and beyond that, I would want just 100% of the big deals because I, you know, I only need so much of a base. So kind of a two-part answer there for the initial amount of money I need to make to feel just good. And like my business is successful, I'd call it a 70-30 with 70% being the quick stuff and then uh, 30% being the big stuff and then above and beyond that, just all bigger deals. Absolutely. And, and you know, Dan, Dan's one of the least self-certain people I know where that's what makes sense for him right there. And it's, you know, if, if this is your full-time job, you're living off this income, obviously you need income coming in. You know, it's the idea of, uh, you know, what's so attractive to certain aspects of this business where, um, you know, you can get paid, you know, every month, whether you're doing, you know, owner finance deals or these quicker deals and doing wholesales or, or double close, which is, which you don't do very many of those, but of just the quick sales cycle of, you know, the 30, 45 day from, you know, initial contact to sale um, deals where, that's really nice because it feels good because you're looking at, you know, where, you know, my business looks really good is looking at my balance sheet. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, my, my P and L might not look as attractive or on one month it might look like, Oh crap, I made like 300 grand this month. And then on the next month, it's like, well, I lost 200 grand and it's not an actual loss because you look at the equity that you're building in the company from a balance sheet perspective. Um, you know, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, read a book on finance, but um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I, I agree with you, Dan, of, you know, I, I think my business right now is kind of the opposite of yours is mine's yeah. know, 70, 80% these longer term, big, big flips. Um, you know, I'm, I'm married to, a, you know, someone that, you know, pays all the bills. So there's less stress associated with the money coming in um, every month. Uh, but it, it's about building both out of, mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's, you know, kind of creating an owner financing business that covers the operating costs, you know, where you get five, 10, 15, 20 grand a month in, in notes, uh, which is a lot of notes to manage. Um, but then you build out, you know, to me, I, you know, do 50, 50 of, you know, 50% of, or maybe, you know, 50% of the shorter uh, term, you know, quicker cash deals and 50% of, you know, the, the higher, higher return, longer sales cycle deals and having other stuff on the side and, you know, it all depends, um, you know, once again, on your uh, need for income coming in, your individual risk tolerance in general, um, your ability to vertically integrate the business, you know, from, you know, a, a, you know, a development or builder standpoint, um, and how much money you want to make and how much time you have, because you could turn this business into something that's completely automated and delegated to other people. Um, but you're going to need a lot more people if you're going to have, you know, a real good volume business, um, you know, like like the one Dan's creating. You know, both of us have employees that are working for us full time, um, not, you know, the the college kid on the side and, you know, calling, you know, people or door knocking. We have sophisticated, you know, individuals, you know, that are, you know, doing all this for us. So recognize like it's not us, you know, doing this from a side hustle perspective cr to create a million dollar business like you can't you can't do it. Um, or I, I don't think you can, um, but just depends on the individual and the way you look at business. Yeah, no, agreed. And I, I think to summarize the point we're trying to make with this episode is just be aware when you're looking for markets, you're starting your business or just trying to grow your business of what sort of market you're getting into and what sort of expectations you need to have around sales cycles, profit margins, you know, how much you're going to have to spend to get a deal because Oftentimes someone might take a course that teaches 
you know, how to buy and sell the desert squares where it's quick and it's easy. And then they go and try and apply that to a much more expensive, slower market, or even just a competitive market where they can sell quickly, but they need to spend a lot more on marketing to even get a deal. And then they're disappointed. So you need to have an idea or an approximate idea of where on the spectrum between, you know, low volume and, and colder and, and high volume and hotter market, your market falls. Love it. Love it. All right, Dan, anything else you want to add before we get out of here? No, I think that's uh, about it. I hope that was useful, guys. Awesome. All right, Dan, thanks so much. Uh, Mason McDonald and Dan Haverkoss with the Big Picture Blueprint. We'll see you all next time.